Hi everyone, welcome to English Composition 2. This is Module 3, Academic Argument. And in it, we are going to explore ways to uh, begin working on arguments. So the learning outcomes for this module are as follows. By the end of the module, you should be able to evaluate strategies to create and interpret academic arguments, evaluate the elements of academic argument, evaluate how academic arguments use evidence, and break down and build up an academic argument. So why does it matter? Academic argument, or argument in general, does not mean fighting in the academic arena. What it's really referring to is um, proving your point. And its origin, the word or um, argument, its origin is of is Latin. And in Latin, it means to clarify, assert, declare, prove, or show. And in academia, that's exactly what an academic argument does. It clarifies, it makes assertions, it declares something, it proves something, or it shows something. So argument is the actual reasoning behind a claim and the evidence to improve to prove that that reasoning is correct. Arguing adds your voice to the academic community. Not only that, but when you understand and are able to craft an academic argument, you're going to find that that particular skill is going to translate into every single class you take. This isn't just relevant to English. So for example, if you're taking a psychology class, you're going to have to um, make some kind of assertions and prove to your professor that you know what you're talking about. And the same thing in soci sociology, history, and so on. You're proving that you um, understand something or you know something. And even in math, we do this in math with our proofs. We provide the evidence that demonstrates how we get to um, the end result. Same thing with scientific studies. Those are also um, an example of rhetoric, an example of argument. You start with a claim or a hypothesis in the scientific field, and you work through various steps to prove that the hypothesis is either correct or incorrect. And that is what you do in an academic essay. So what is academic argument? The learning outcome um, for this topic, element, elevate, I'm sorry, goodness gracious, evaluate the elements of academic argument. Um, so in order to do that, you need to examine the elements of an argument, explain the difference between fact, opinion, judgment, and argument, identify strategies to evaluate an argument's perspective, and identify strategies to recognize and analyze bias. So we're going to be working on all of those. So what makes an academic argument an academic argument? You begin with a topic of choice, or what, if a particular topic is assigned to you, you add your claim, and then you add your reasons and evidence that support that claim. So the claim will show your perspective. Um, global warming is a hoax, okay? That's my perspective. And then my reason and evidence will, um, I will provide proof. I'll look at scientific studies and research um, and that, that will support my claim. And, um, and I will include um, addressing those people who would disagree with me, all right? And explaining to them why they're incorrect. I need to have a clear understanding of my audience um, who's going to be reading it and how will they relate and understand why the topic is important. And then I need to also have a clear idea of my oppose, opposing point of view. And that is all of the people or the arguments rather that would disagree with um, my perspective. Those claims uh, that are different from my own. This brings us to facts, opinions, judgment, 
and inference. And I would add to this beliefs, all right? And I'll, I'll talk about each of these just briefly. So a fact is observable, verifiable information that is void of opinion. Today is Sunday, January 23rd, all right? There's no opinion in that. I don't think it's January 23rd. I know it's January 23rd. You can look on the date of this recording to see, to prove that this was recorded on January 23rd. So that's a way, that's a fact, okay? Um, Joe Biden is the current president of the United States of America. That is a fact. It can be verified, right, with evidence. So, um that's what facts are. They're verifiable. You can prove them to be true. All right. Opinions, and this is really important, important, are statements that cannot be proven based on evidence. So um, in order to prove an opinion, um, you have to have clear facts to support those opinions. It can't just be evidence. And this is a kind of a, a glitch that I have with Waymaker because I feel like as they are thinking of opinions here or using the word opinions, that's very similar to how I use beliefs, okay? Um, if you believe in God, okay, I can't argue with that belief. That is something that you believe. Um, I, I can say I don't believe in God, but that doesn't impact your belief, right? That doesn't change it. So this is something that belongs to you. And if you're using an opinion that belongs to you, that is uniquely yours, that cannot be argued or disagreed with, then to me, that's a, well, it can be disagreed with, but that's an, a belief. It's something that we can't really prove or disprove, all right? Judgments, which are also part of an argument, are subjective observations based on facts and infused with personal bias. So car insurance in premium, premium should be based on how much or how little people drive. That is a judgment. I can certainly argue why I think this, right? Um, I can prove that... Um, you know, those people, maybe I can prove it. I haven't looked at the evidence. So, but if I look at the evidence, I should be able to prove that those people who drive um, uh, fewer than two hours a week are going to have um, a much lower risk of being involved in any kind of um, accident. All right. Now, the opposite might say, that depends on where the person lives. Um, because if I live, you know, in New York City and I drive two hours a week, just because of the sure volume of traffic, my statistics for having an accident, even though I'm driving not that I'm not driving that much, certainly are more than say if I drive no more than two hours a week living in um, my small town of West Point, Virginia, which has 3,000 people in it, okay? So that, so there are different ways or different perspectives that you can use with judgments, and that's why that word subjective is in there. And an inference is a statement that is based on experience and reason, but based on the unknown. So I can think that global warming is going to kill humanity by 2050. I can't really prove that um, because it hasn't happened yet, right? And we don't know what changes in technologies and improvements in air quality are going to occur between now and 2050. So um, I can't prove that, but I can infer based on some evidence that this is likely to happen. So a big, huge part of argument is perspective. And you're going to hear about perspective a lot. What is the perspective? 
And perspective comes from your own knowledge and experiences. It's kind of sort of related to that opinion thing, your perspective. So a perspective of affects how you approach an argument. What is your perspective? Are you um, for or against that particular topic? And, and this is the key where the academic part comes in, it brings a new and I would add deeper level of analysis and argument to the topic. It's uh, in order to understand arguments, you need to ask yourself, who is making the claim? All right, who is making this claim that um, global warming is going to kill humanity by 2050? It's just um, an English professor who has no uh, experience uh, studying global warming uh, from a scientific perspective, right? So my perspective is very different than uh, a climatologist or um, someone who studies weather or who studies air quality, right? I, I have a very different perspective than a scientist. And we can look at perspective or when we're looking at perspective, we need to consider identity. So what is the race, the class, the gender? All of these things impact perspective and impact how you perceive um, something. And that brings us to bias. Bias is an inclination towards or against a person, a thing, or an idea. There's different kinds of biases. Hopefully you've heard of these. Um, certainly there has been a lot of news about confirmation bias. But let's begin with impl implicit bias. Implicit bias is the unconscious or hidden stereotypes that we have. And I can give you a really good example of that. Um, I was, as an undergraduate, I was taking a philosophy course and um, my family's all from the Midwest and we had moved to Virginia rather recently. And I was um, taking a philosophy course at Virginia Commonwealth. And I had this professor that had a huge, very thick, almost to the point of not being understandable, um, Southern accent. And because of my implicit bias, which came from my family, I immediately assumed that this professor did had no idea what he was talking about because he sounded ignorant. He sounded Southern, right? Please don't be offended, people. This was a long time ago, and I was a young person. And I'm explaining, I'm using this as an example. So don't hate me. Don't be hating. All right. So um, my point is because I had this unconscious bias that people who had a thick Southern accent were less intelligent than those who uh, had a Midwestern accent, accent um, really um, was to my detriment because as I remained in the course, I realized that this professor although I did have difficulty sometimes understanding him, was an amazing scholar and thinker. And so I was able to get over that bias because of my experience. I was able to say, oh yeah, well, that's really dumb way to think because just because you have a Southern accent doesn't really have any connection to um, how intelligent you are. There's also confirmation bias, and hopefully you've heard about this by now in the world around you. And this is, you know, we hear confirmation bias uh, a lot in terms of the social media that we use, that we like pages or respond to uh, tweets that are related to our beliefs. They reaffirm what we already believe or think. You know, yeah, that a boy, I agree. Um, that's confirmation bias. And a lot of times what we do when we're looking at an argument or look, looking at a claim is we only seek information from those people who agree with us. And good academic uh, research requires that we look outside of that nice, neat little box of everybody that thinks we're right or um, that agrees with us. And we move beyond that and we look at um, it, it, people who disagree with us, who don't come with the same perspectives and the same outlook as we have. So we have to consciously 
work against confirmation bias. There's also availability bias, bias, using recent instances to evaluate topics or decisions. When you're writing an academic argument, you have to look at the big picture. You can't just rely on something that happened yesterday or um, a study that was published yesterday that maybe disagrees with three studies that were published um, last year. So you've got to, to look at the big picture and where that most recent information sits among all of the information that you have. Does it come from a viable resource? Um, was the study done in an academic manner? Um, was the Were the results peer reviewed? So you've got to really dig a little bit deeper than just it's current or recent. Then there's recency bias, which relies more on recent events than previous events. So um, this happened yesterday, therefore it's likely to happen tomorrow, right? Um, recency bias can be seen uh, a lot when we're talking about COVID. Well, so many people died yesterday, so chances are this many people are going to die tomorrow. However, as we see in reality that those numbers are going up and down, up and down all the time and changing, changing uh, depending on the time of year, depending on location, depending on number of people involved. So it's a lot of different things to, depending on vaccine status. And then there's framing bias, where you make decisions solely based on how they are presented. So this person uh, presented a really good argument. So they must know what they're talking about. Therefore, the argument must be valid. And we do that a lot when we are listening to experts. Well, so-and-so said, you know, therefore it must be right. And that's not always true. Again, when we're looking at information, we have to look at the big picture. We have to remove ourselves and step back from our own beliefs and our own perspectives and really analyze the information that's out there and available to us. So here's a pra your first practice question. Which of the following states a claim that could serve as the basis of an argumentative essay? I find violence in movies, television shows, and video games to be deeply distressing. There should be laws in place to regulate the amount of violence that can be shown on TV. <coughs> Excuse me. There is a long dis history of disagreement over whether it is the government's role to regulate the amount of violence that can be depicted in mass media. And number four, is it the government's role to regulate the amount of violence that can be shown in mass media? So what do you think is the best claim? Number four, we can eliminate because it's a question and claims are generally not questions. They are statements. Number one, I find violence in movies, television shows, and video games to be deeply distressing. That's a personal opinion right? That's something that I feel or I believe, and I, you can't argue with feelings and beliefs. It's actually a feeling because distress, distress is a feeling. So you can't argue with how someone feels, right? There should be laws in place to regulate the amount of violence that can be shown on TV. Well, that's getting a little bit closer, and there is a long history of disagreement whether it is the government's role to regulate the amount of violence that can be depicted in mass media. So which one do you think it is? There should be laws in place to regulate the amount of violence that can be shown on TV. Or there is a long history of disagreement over whether it is the government's role to regulate the amount of violence that can be depicted in mass media. Which one of those statements can you prove? Probably the easiest is number three. Number two, there should be laws in place to regulate the amount of violence that can be shown on TV, is an opinion. Okay, so one is a feeling, two is an opinion. Three, we can look at um, the kinds of disagreements that have occurred over um, whether it's the government's role. 
All right, we can do some research on that and see what uh, topics have been discussed about the government's role and what kinds of legislation has been incorporated, what kind of rating systems are in place. So we can actually um, research that. So evidence. In order to research that, we're going to need to evident, to find some good solid evidence. So our learning outcome under evidence is to evaluate how academic arguments use evidence. In order to do that, you need to recognize evidence in an academic context. What does evidence look like? Evaluate facts and statistics as evidence. So you need to be look, be able to look at d data and make some, draw some reasonable conclusions. You need to evaluate text as evidence. You need to be able to analyze text and again, draw some um, analysis, uh, some information from that. You need to be able to evaluate experimental results as evidence. How valid is experimental data? And evaluate lived experience as evidence. So, well, I'll, I'll, we'll just go through that. So what is evidence? It can look um, like many different things. It is proof that supports the overall claim. Pictures in a product review provide proof. All right, and we've got this picture of um, that someone posted of their vacuum cleaner, it looks like, on fire, okay? It, it is raw data that is presented to strengthen a claim. It varies based on the field of study. So if you remember from last week's uh, discussion, we talked about quantitative and qualitative data and um, that, those kinds of data. It can never speak for itself. Evidence always needs some kind of analysis, all right, some kind of perspective provided about it. And evidence must always, always be integrated and explained by the author. This is a challenge that a lot of students face. They think that if they put, um, use a quote from an authority and just pop it into the middle of their es essay, that that constitutes evidence. And it's close, it's almost there, but unless you have that analysis of the evidence, you really haven't done your job. You haven't um, taken that extra step in the communication process to ensure that those people who disagree with you or who agree with you understand how you are analyzing that piece of evidence. So good evidence always, always, always includes deep analysis. So let's look at a little bit, uh, dive a little bit deeper into different kinds of evidence. Uh, statistics as evidence. Statistics clarify claims and anticipate objectives. Objection, sorry. Statistical data can provide background information, answer a research question, convince the audience, when you are using statistical data, you need to uh, consult several different sources. Don't get all of your statistical data from one place. And that can be really challenging on the internet because so often uh, the same story is shared over and over and over again and um, uses the same evidence. So you've got to dig a little bit deeper and find some confirmation of that evidence. You always want to search for tables, graphs, or written findings. And then you want to, back to that um, uh, analysis again, you want to evaluate your data. What kind of research methods are you going to use for your data collection? Um, how do you determine the relevance of the data to the research question? And how do you ensure that the data was not skewed? And all of this comes with deeper research. That's really the point of English 112. You may have been introduced to uh, research in 111, but in 112, that really is the basis of the course, is to really dig deeply into that evidence, to look beyond the simplistic, the easy, the surface level information, and really find out um, what's going on, what's truly happening, what is truly being said, 
where those numbers come from. How are those numbers being analyzed? Who is analyzing those numbers? If anyone has taken a statistics class, you know that statistics can be manipulated. So numbers can easily be manipulated to mean something specific depending on how the statistician interprets and um, uses those numbers. Next, we have text as evidence. A text is any object that can be read. When we're using textual evidence, we're looking for direct quotations. When you use a direct quotation, you must use the exact wording followed by an explication. Again, I've got this evidence. It's a direct quote from this article I read. Now I have to explain it. I have to analyze it. Summaries can be used when specific language is not as important as the overall message. So you can summarize information from a text when the terminology isn't relevant. When the terminology is relevant, the exact words are relevant, then that's when you need to add those direct quotes. And secondary works are also, um, just like you want to check your numbers, you also want to check your um, written evidence. You want to find out what others have said about that evidence, about that piece of writing, about that particular article. Um, what do the author's peers have to say? Uh, and those kinds of things. We have experimental evidence, and that is the evidence that we find in the sciences. This is usually quantitative data. data remember, numer numerical. It can include qualitative data, issues of value. It follows the scientific method. It starts with an observation that leads to a research question. You have a hypothesis that guesses how the question will be answered. And then you're, you conduct experiments with different variables and controls. And then you change the variables or vary them while the controls will not be manipulated to test your results, and ultimately you um, have a result that is based on the connective evidence to the claim. Newer studies, again, don't overrule older studies, and the more data from various studies, the clearer the evidence becomes. So the more um, information you can find that confirms your scientific result, uh, the more valid or the stronger evidence you have. We also have experience as evidence, and that requires a, a couple of different things. So there's subject experience, societal position, or, scientific, or, sorry, or specific evidence can give authority to claims. So for example, if I wanted to talk about the um, lifespan of gerbils, I wouldn't talk to um, my English professor, I would probably talk to a biologist who has studied gerbils, right? He or she would have the experience of working with gerbils and studying them to know better what their life expectancy is than me. Bias is also a major concern with experience. Um, people usually do what they like and talk about what they like, so they might be leaving out important uh, pieces of information that might disagree with their experience or might complicate the validity of their experience. So always think about what's not being said, what's missing. Um, it can be experimental, experiential evidence, sorry, can be extremely strong. So your experience can be quite valid, but it can't be the only thing you use, all right? Um, so for example, I had a woman who wrote an argumentative essay about hunting um, for subsist subsistence. So rather than buying your meat in the grocery store, you hunted um, and got your meat that you used throughout the year during hunting season. And um, she used her experiential or her experience as exper experiential evidence, but she did not rely on that alone. She also looked to um, 
experts like uh, uh, ecologists and scientists who are studying the impact of um, raising meat on global warming and and, and um, those kinds of things. So she looked at it from a variety of perspectives, not just her own. So you can get experiential evidence through an in-person interview, a phone call, or an email. Um, and if you're going to do an email or ask questions to get some experiential evidence, make sure you do some background research first and have some appropriate questions written down. Um, so you can either, send, it's really helpful if you can send them to the interviewer, the person you're going to interview beforehand so that he or she has some time to really think about those answers and aren't caught off guard. And be sure to set a specific time and follow through. I would add to that, um, which isn't listed, is always send a thank you note. Um, you know, thank someone for their time and for their expertise. Um, it just puts you in their good graces and allows you to ask additional questions should you need to do so. So here's practice question number two. Which of the following is a reason you should include evidence in your research? One, to prove your perspective is correct. Two, to test every hypothesis. C, to summarize a specific claim or D, to give variety to your argument. So which one is the correct answer? Is it A, B, C, or D? What do you think, guys? Well, we can kind of get rid of B because we can't test every hypothesis. It, that's just not humanly possible. We can summarize a specific claim, certainly, and it can give variety to our argument, and it can prove that your perspective is correct. So I would probably say A um, is the best answer of those three. So the next learning outcome that we're gonna look at is breaking down and building up an argument. So this learning outcome requires that you describe techniques for breaking down arguments, ways to analyze. You describe techniques for building an analytical argument, and you identify ways to combine ideas and produce something new. That is called synthesis. And a good academic argument is a synthesis of analysis that you have um, explored and uh, reviewed. So your um, in Waymaker, they spend a lot of time talking about the Toolman method. We are not going to look at the Toolman method in this class. We will not use the Toolman method in this class. And the reason I don't use the Toolman method is it gets clouded in um, a lot of terminology. And I want to just simply, or I want to simplify that. And in order to do that, I follow the Aristotelian or classic model of argumentation. And that is the kind of argument that you're going to be writing in this class. So the a classical model of argumentation um, has a claim. It has the purpose that, and that claim is the purpose or goal of an argument. It includes grounds the reasons that support that claim. And it connects those grounds to the claim, usually analyzing the ethics of an argument. It provides backing, additional support of the warrant. Um, it has a rebuttal, an objection to the claim that is anticipated and addressed. And it usually has uh, some sort of conclusion that is a response to the opposition to that um to the or puts the rebuttal in perspective. Um, and so this is the Toolman method. And again, I'm using um, uh, or the, the classic, at, and you can kind of put the classic model on top of the, the Toolman, just not using the terms as much. So the question I want to research is what is pet is easiest to care for? My claim, 
is that goldfish are the easiest pets to care for. And the reason is because they have the they require the least maintenance. Now, my backing is the evidence that comes from my research about maintenance. All right, so that's my evidence. Um, and then my um, warrant in this case is the feeding is the only real responsibility making them easy to care for, which makes them easy to care for. And evidence surrounding the feeding requirements is my backing. The rebuttal, but why do so many goldfish die? So they might be easy to care for, but they're not a long-lived pet, um, and they frequently die, or they easily die. Um, so my qualifier, or my conclusion, is that although goldfish may be the easiest to care for, they still do require care. So you can't just ignore that you have one. If you cannot answer the claim, grounds, backing, and warrant, the argument is not complete. So make sure that you have um, an outline like this for your argument. It doesn't have to be a formal outline, but make sure you can identify these elements of your argument before you begin actually writing the essay. So we're going to build an argument using the Aristotelian or classical style of argument. Um, and that the Aristotelian style seeks to persuade the audience to join your side of the argument. So I want my audience to think, feel, or believe something based on my position. All right. So the format of an Aristotelian argument introduces the issue. It has a thesis statement, which is a claim. It presents my case, which uses both my evidence and my warrants. It addresses the opposition. It explains why, which is called a rebuttal. It explains why people might disagree with my perspective. And it presents, um, and then I provide my proof and explain why people who disagree with me um, aren't, are wrong what they're doing, you know, how they're looking at the issue incorrectly or not, maybe not looking at all components or not analyzing uh, specific data in the way that I analyzed it or in the way that the experts that I'm relying on have analyzed it. And then I um, move finally to my conclusion, which I like to have um, a call to action. So if I'm going to go back to the last slide and use the goldfish, so I might say, I might end my essay on um, purchasing a goldfish uh, because it requires minimal care, is um, if you have the time to care for, um, to provide care for your goldfish, on a regular basis, then why not go to PetSmart and pick up a goldfish today? All right. So I'm saying, you know, hey, if you can do this and you want a low maintenance companion, goldfish is the answer. Go get one. That is a persuasive technique that we use when constructing an academic argument. Academic arguments also include um, ethos, <clears throat> pathos, and logos. Sorry about the problems. Hold on a second, folks. Hopefully they've stopped barking. So I want to talk about ethos, pathos, and logos. You really need all of these, and I would include kairos in this as well. Ethos is an appeal to the character of the writer. So when you are doing your academic research, you are establishing your character. You are um, using ethical um, research and you are um, demonstrating to the readers through your extensive research that you know what you're talking about, that you've looked at and examined, analyzed all the different perspectives. Then we have pathos, which is appealing to emotion. So if you want to get somebody to do something, they need to feel like doing that. And you use pathos. It's not, you know, people think, people often um, misconstrue the concept of pathos and think they have to make people angry or, or sad. 
the way that you integrate pathos into an argument is the language that you use, the words, the terms, the style and the tone of your argument is the way to integrate emotion into an argument. And then there's logos, which you use um, logic, all right? Good research, good evidence always demonstrates a form of logic that A plus B equals C because, all right? Um, and so that you can explain what that because part is and that logic. You need to be able to ex explain uh, or demonstrate the logic of your argument. Kairos is about the timeliness of your um, argument. You want to argue about issues that are relevant right now. You don't want to talk about something that um, uh, it doesn't matter to your readers today. Okay, but what matters right now? So, for example, if I'm using Kairos, I might um, be talking about the requirement of uh, Thomas Nelson that students and faculty and employees all wear masks while on campus. Um, that is something that is timely because it's a requirement that is happening right now. Um, three years ago, that wouldn't have been a topic worth discussing at all. Ten years ago, who would care? Hopefully, next year, we won't care about mask wearing, right? So it's the timeliness, Kairos. Let's see. Oops, I got to move. Let's go on to the next slide. Uh, there we go. There we go. Sorry about that. So the next kind of argument that we're going to focus on, and the last two really are the ones that we're going to be working with this semester. That was the first, or the second, first one was Toulmin. We're not going to bother with that. <clears throat> we're going to look at the classical Aristotelian argument, and we're going to look at the Rogerian style of argument. And the Rogerian style of argument is more, um, uses more pathos, I guess, because it employs empathy no, and an understanding that your reader may not really be ag agreeable to your stance. And this is kind of uh, a, an organizational technique. We will look at this in more depth when we get to the point of writing our Rogerian essay. But a, a Rogerian essay introduces the topic. It doesn't have a position necessarily. It's just giving the background information that a reader needs to have to understand what you're going to be arguing for or against. And then in the first paragraph or the first section of the essay, I would say, because, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> a Rogerian argument is more than a five paragraph essay, as are all of the, um, essays you'll write in this class, but in the first section of the paper, you're going to be present and relate or explain how those um, who disagree with you have um, relevance to their, to their viewpoints, why these viewpoints are understandable, all right? Then in the second section, you're going to acknowledge those viewpoints, but then begin to explain what is not exactly or why your um, viewpoint makes more sense, makes better sense, while your solution. And finally, the final section or the next to last section is um, the space where you want to take a few paragraphs to explain um, why your perspective is right. And um, you really want this is where the bulk of your research comes in. And you want to try to work through a way that you can find consensus where both sides of the argument or the different perspectives can find a sort of middle ground. It means, and this is the challenge with a Rogerian argument, that both parties are going to need to compromise in some sense. So you don't get all your way, um, your opposition doesn't get all of its way, but rather you work together and you come to a consensus of how to work 
towards the future in a way that will satisfy both perspectives. And the reason we write Rogerian arguments in this class is because it's very much an example of how government ought to work. You know, we live in a two-party system, and those two parties, uh, especially now, are very, um, disagree very strongly with one another. And in order for us to see progress, those two sides actually need to present their perspectives, have their perspectives validated and analyzed to see which, you know, what is the most important part of those perspectives. And then we need to work really hard to find a way to compromise so that both parties <clears throat> are getting um, fair treatment. And um, it's not one-sided, it's not all or nothing, but that we actually end up creating something new where we can all work together and move forward. So <clears throat> one of the key elements of your argumentative essay will be synthesis, the ability to combine ideas. So you get information from this place, you get information from another place, and you're going to combine that information. You're going to synthesize it and bring it together. And in order to do this, there are some key things that you need to do. You need to review several different texts, and I would add types of text, not just look at textbooks or journals, but look at um, a variety of texts. Look for both sides of the argument being uh, presented. You want to look for people that um, agree with a particular claim, and then you also want to equally give time to those who disagree. You want to look for the pieces that are missing. What in the claim <clears throat> or in the argument is being left out or not considered. And you want to look at comparisons and contrasts to get a full picture. In which way are um, these claims similar and in which ways are they different? <clears throat> Synthesizing is so very important because it creates a stronger argument by comparing various texts to get a more in-depth view of a subject. So it really allows you to dive deeper. Now here's your third practice question. Why is it important to break down an argument? A, to see what other sources may be helpful. B, to find gaps or contradictions in the argument. C, to fully understand your essay. Or D, it isn't important, it's only needed in rare cases. A is a pretty good idea, but actually it's B to find the gaps or contradictions in the argument. So <clears throat> what claims are being made and what's missing from those claims, right? What's missing, um, what disagrees with that claim? And that can help you um, better understand what is going on in a particular argument. So here's your quick review. This is your final. Um, an academic argument gives a topic, a claim, and reasons for evidence. That what you will find in every academic argument, whether you're using Toulmin, Aristotelian, or Regerian. Um, you need to have understanding, or it is important that you understand facts, opinions, judgments, inferences, and perspectives, um, because these all create bias, um, and that creates can either strengthen or weaken your argument, depending on how you employ that bias. Evidence is proof that supports a claim. Every argument needs evidence. Types of evidence can be statistics, text, experiments, and experience. Those are all types. Um, and you need to analyze your evidence. Don't just stick it out there and say, oh, this is proof, but actually provide some analysis. Explain how that evidence is um, being uh, understood in, in used in your argument. Break down an ar breaking down an argument will help you to find the gaps and the weaknesses in that argument, and building up or creating an argument helps you develop ideas and ensures a complete, well-rounded argument. Uh, synthesizing several talks create a stronger argument, or synthesizing several perspectives, several different 
um, ways of looking at a claim will create your strongest argument. So that's all I have for now. Um, I know this is a long one, so I hope you took notes and um, I'll be back again real soon.